morning, Tui Mora. Good to see all of you here. For those of you who don't know me, my name is AJ Kutsia. Uh, together with my wife, Marita, Josh and Jana, and our Danish dog, Kenya, we left our hometown in the Western Cape, province of South Africa, to settle here in Hilderson. This is my wife, Marita. Um, um, <coughs> yeah, I'd like to thank Gifford, Geraldine, and the elders for allowing me to share our message. And I want to thank you as a congregation for, for this opportunity to share a bit of our hearts and, and of our journey. Uh, we are often asked by people, why have you moved to the Netherlands? And contrary to popular belief, it is not because of your cheese, <laughs> your windmills, <laughs> or your weather. <laughs> and this, the purpose of this message is not only to answer these questions, but also to give a biblical perspective of our faith journey as a family. In the book of Hebrews in the New Testament of the Bible, we read, Therefore we are surrounded by such great cloud of witnesses. We throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles us. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. To give you some context, uh, the author of Hebrews wrote this book as a sermon letter to the Hebrew, uh, Jewish Hebrews, uh, Jewish Christians, at around 70 AD. It is one of 66 books of the Bible written by 40 authors over a period of 1,500 years. The majority of them were not related and lived in different time spans. One word with one divine message as a golden thread from the beginning to the end, from the Alpha to the Omega. The, the message is God calling his people out of a worldly context into and towards his destiny, being a divine destiny. That's a thread from Genesis right through to Revelation. It is a calling out of and a calling into. God is writing his story by using our stories to write this story being the history of the world. In chapter 12 of the book of Hebrews, the author uses a metaphor of running. And it's running an endurance race. Um, <coughs> And chapter 12 is preceded by chapter 11. And chapter 11 speaks about the faith. A very well-known chapter in the Bible referring to the faith journey. A couple of years ago, uh, I decided for some odd reason to take up triath triathlon as a sport. Um, to my family's stress, every, every race I did, they were stressful. And I, every, after every race, they had me promise that I will never do it again. And then I do it again. But before I started to participate and practice and exercise for this endurance race, I f called a good friend of mine um, who was an Olympic athlete, he participated in two Olympic Games as a triathlete. He, he was nine times the US champion in triathlons, especially off-road triathlons. So I called him up. Why did I call him up? Because he had experience, he had knowledge, and he had the reputation to back it. That is the reason why I phoned Conrad Stoltz that day. And he helped me, and he helped me with preparation and for this race. Um, and I, I've learned a lot specifically in how to prepare, how to compete, and how to endure. Mm -hmm. 
Conrad used to spend hours in envisioning his race. So I actually asked him, what do you do? How do you prepare for a race? And he would sit for hours upon hours envisioning the pain he is going to go through. Because like in any endurance race, you are going to suffer. <laughs> I promise you. And I specifically remember one race that I participated. Um, uh, it was in East London in South Africa. Um, and you had to run a course twice. And there was this hill they call Bunker's Hill. And the, the second time I ran up this hill, I thought, I cannot do this anymore. I was absolutely finished. And I remember standing there. Everything was just cramping. And... The only thing that pushed me forward was the fact that I could, I did envision that I'm going to suffer and anticipated that. But in the envisioning, I envisioned the goal, the end line, where I have to be in 7.5 kilometers from there. And that enabled me to continue with this race and to endure and persevere because of the envisioning. And the author of Hebrews is addressing this very issue in his letter to the Hebrews by using the experience and successes of the great faith heroes. These are heroes that existed in history, in secular history, as well as in biblical history. And he, helped in, and he actually guides them how to prepare, compete, and endure in this life. And he addresses five things. One, he says, it's going to be a long race that requires endurance. Secondly, we have to prepare for this race. Thirdly, the race has been marked out for us. Fourthly, there are supporters in this race that have already run this race with experience and a good reputation. And fifthly, our eyes should be fixed on Jesus while running this race. So what does this mean and how do we make sense of this in this life race? It says that the race has been marked out for us. What does that mean? Has it been marked out for me personally? Has it been marked out for us collectively or both? Has it been... Have, as, is there a race that has been predestined for you, Andrew, Mike, all of us? Is there a race and is there a path that God prepared for us? And how do we run it and do we run it on our own or collectively? In chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews, it refers to faith giants and supporters. And I want to single out two of them. Firstly, Abraham. Abraham is the father of faith. And as of today, there are more than 4 billion believers that are following the faith that Abraham started in his faith journey. And the second is Jesus, the author, pioneer of our faith. If you were a boxer, imagine having Muhammad Ali in your corner supporting you and or if you were a footballer, imagine having Lionel Messi coaching you and supporting you. Mm -hmm. David, <laughs> imagine that. You're a cricketer, having Gary Kirsten behind you. So this is how you need to bat. This is how you need to catch the ball. That is what we have here in Hebrews 11. We have faith heroes. Abraham, four billion followers of the same faith that he started to proclaim. At around 3000 BC, in the land of Ur of the Chaldeans, not far from the modern day Baghdad, a man named Abram, when called to go to a place, he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed in faith, and went, even though he did not know where he was going, by faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country, 
and he lived in tents, as did Isaac, Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to a city whose foundations, whose architect and builder is God. That is a faith hero. And personally, is one of my heroes. We share the same name, Abraham. What, what can we learn from Abraham, the father of the two largest faith move movements in the world? Abraham obeyed, and he left everything behind. Just to give you some context of Abraham, we, we know he came from, the, from Ur. Um, the historic text refers to uh, the people of Ur being moon worshippers. So the probability that Abraham was a follower of God is unprobable. He received a call from God as a non-believer and acted in faith. Secondly, he came from a very wealthy family. How do we know that? Well, in later in Genesis, it refers to Abraham's 317 men that went to war. If you have 317 men, you probably have 900 people, to 1,000 people following you. 317 young fighting men. So we were talking about not only a small family like us leaving a country, but we were talking about a wealthy man, call him a prince if you want, leaving his country, convincing a thousand people to go with him. Where to? I don't know. God said go. So he acted in faith. An interesting thing happened there. It was a faith action that he took combined with a physical action of leaving something two parallel actions that were taken a faith action and a physical action that happened sometimes we make uh, so, sorry Hebrews 11 one refers to faith that is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. The substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things seen. And we, we tend to make faith very complicated. In my line of business, I work with entrepreneurs and CEOs of companies who direct and steer their companies in a direction and with a conviction of where they think this company needs to go to grow and to make money. So I've got a low battery here. That's interesting. <laughs> but luckily I've got paper. <laughs> um, the problem with the paper is my, my arms are a bit short for that. <laughs> okay, right. Um, so we, we tend to complicate faith because the, a, a business owner or a visionary has got a vision to go somewhere based on certain convictions and truths that he has. A scientist like my friend Lawrence would work in, in his lab and he would, based on certain facts, have a, a hypothesis of what can be done. Like any scientist, it's an hypothesis. Based on these New Newton laws, I believe we will be able to do that. It, it doesn't exist at that stage. It is based on certain facts but it is a, f a step in action towards something that is not seen yet. Similarly, my faith in God is not blind. Personally, it is not blind. It is a leap of faith based on known truths that I take an action f spiritually as well as physically. 
It is a leap of action based on truths. I was just referring to the Bible, written over 1,500 years, with many authors that's spreading over this, the whole period. And just in the Old Testament, more than 300 prophecies of the li birth, life, death, and the resurrection of Christ. 300 prophecies over more than 1,000 years written about the birth, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. So my faith is based on truth. The saying goes that hindsight is 2020 vision. We have the privilege of 2020 vision today. Because we've got the faithful lives and experiences of successful people in Hebrews that Hebrews is referring towards. Hebrews 11 also re re reads that these people were seeking a homeland, and, and if they had been thinking of that land from whom they have gone, they would have had the opportunity to return. But, but as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one, in other words, a divine destination. During 2020 and 2021, God stirred up in the hearts of us as a family a desire to go to another country. We did not know what it meant, but continued to trust God that God would make it clear to us. On 18 September 2021, we returned from a trip to the Netherlands and Europe. And I remember on the Sunday morning, 19 September, I woke up, that was the day after we arrived back from the Netherlands, and I said to Marita, I think God stirred in me a desire to go back to the Netherlands. That was the very next morning. Um, Marita looked up and said, maybe you should go. So I booked a ticket. A couple of days later, I was back in the Netherlands. I did not know why I was here. I did not know where to go. I had no clue, honestly. Um, but we did a couple of things. We said, God, if it's your will that we need to go, please give us some signs that, that we can know this is, your, this is your will. So we took a leap of faith. We put our house on the market for a very cheeky high price. And that I did the afternoon before I boarded the plane. The next morning, around about 12 o'clock, when I arrived at Doha with a st at a stopover, I looked at my telephone, and before I say this, in South Africa to sell a house, you are lucky if you sell your house within six months. Typically three to six months. Three, you're very lucky, six months. And the market is not as alive in the Netherlands. So we said, this is, this is uh, we put our faith in God that he will show us the way. That morning in Doha, I looked at my phone. We had two offers, full price, one in cash. Eight hours later. So I arrived here being well aware of the fact that to find a house in the Netherlands would be very difficult. I had no clue where to start looking, not even a city, nothing. And uh, I did a couple of trips, and one of my trip uh, stopovers was an evening spent with Frank and Isabel um, in Den Bosch, friends of us from South Africa, Isabel from the Western Cape, Frank from Den Bosch. And um, I remember Frank and I sat that evening over a glass of one of his good French wines, maybe two glasses, uh, a bottle. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Isabel. <laughs> and I said to Frank, except with my hand and my heart, I do not know where to go and where to start. And Frank said, well, why don't you call Eric? I said, Eric, that's interesting. I remember Eric. Eric was at your wedding eight years ago. 
And I connected with one person eight years ago at his wedding. And that was Eric that's sitting here today. Why don't you phone Eric? So I called up Eric, sent him a text. Um, Eric, I'm around. Apparently, you have a house available in Hilversum. Yes, I have a house. Come have a look. Um, on 14 October, I booked into the Lapis Felt Hotel in Hilversum. Um, and I remember going to my room. Where I had supper. It was about 8 o'clock. I went into my room, and I rem vividly remembered praying. I said to God, God, what am I doing here? Am I crazy to bring my family here, leaving behind our house with an ocean view of Table Mountain, the ocean and the wildlands? Um, why am I here? What am I doing here? So my prayer lasted for about 30 seconds. I had, did not have more faith than that or any more words to pray. And I remember I stood up. I took a book that I was reading from Dallas Willard, opened the book, and there it's, it, re it reads, Go be a light beacon. I thought, okay, that's good for me for tonight. Close the book. Um, <laughs> went to bed. The next morning I woke up and there was a text message on my phone from Eric. Eric decided to take the day off. We've had probably one or two conversations at all. And he arrived the next morning to fetch me took me to Loestrecht to show me the Loestrecht Plasse. And there at Loestrecht, he took me to a cafe. Um, and I remember we had a great cup of coffee and a conversation. And as we walked out, I haven't shared this with Eric, I saw <laughs> right in front of me this. That is a church currently in Loestrecht, opposite the cafe. I walked right up to it and I saw Lichtbarken. I don't know if you remember, Eric. I, st I stopped, I took a photo, and I was overwhelmed. I thought, thank you. This is the second, uh, second sign. Um, this was one of many, many miracles. I can keep you busy for quite a while. It was miracles and Lichtbarken on our journey and our race that brought us from South Africa to the Netherlands. A Luchtbark and primarily does two things. It, sh it, it shines light in the darkness and it guides you on your tour and on your journey to ensure you on on journey. The author of Hebrews also refers to a pioneer and light beacon, Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. In the book of John, we find one of the most profound descriptions of Jesus as our light beacon or licht and It reads, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that, was, that is made. In Him was life, and that life was a light for all mankind. The light shines in darkness, and the darkness has not overcome. The light shines in darkness, and the darkness has not overcome. We are directed to throw off everything that hinders us. And this is an integral part of a journey. In any race, you always try to throw off excess weight. I'm not sure if Giles is here today. But uh, we had an interesting conversation on Friday. Um, and he tried to convince himself to buy a carbon bike instead of a steel bike. So Everett and I had a very interesting banter with him to say, well, why, Giles, why do you need a carbon bike? Because it's lighter and I'll go faster and be able to endure more. In Exodus, God's people are called out of Egypt through the wilderness into a promised land. 
they had to leave the security and comfort of their journey into a wilderness. Paul also refers to this in Philippians, saying, I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind me, Stellenbosch, South Africa, and straining forward to what lies ahead of us. I press on forward to this upward call. Well, while I was preparing for this message, um, one of my friends sent me an image of this sculpture by Bruno Catalano. If you can put that on. It is a Spanish sculptor that creates artwork depicting the challenges immig immigrants go through. For me, the sculpture speaks about forgetting what lies behind us and the stripping and the loss of the sentimental things that's so important to us. As a family, we can resemble this. In all respects, leaving our friends, our family behind, 300 days of sunshine, <laughs> selling all your possessions and belongings, and boarding a plane to a destination, Netherlands, on 20 April last year. When you make a decision like this to leave behind, which is known to the unknown, you experience a profound sense of being emotionally uprooted while presented with the potential conflict and thrive. We live simultaneously in two worlds, the outer experience of circumstances and the inner world of emotions and thoughts. Immigration presents this dualism. And I see many friends here today that has gone through it and is busy going through it. But God knew all of this in advance when he envisioned Effort and Geraldine to lead a home group that started in their garden to become a church and a light beacon, not only for us as internationals, but also for the Dutch people. And this is the garden church. The church we come from, its name is Cedars, like a cedar tree. Imagine this, the cedar kernel is planted in the garden to start growing. He knew this all in advance. And I'd like to thank the Dutch people and the Dutch people in this congregation for being light beacons. And I can start referring to names. I can refer to Don being an oak of righteousness. I can refer to Kies being serving with him, dedication and strength. Strength, I said strength. You should shake his hand. It's just power. So, so many people I can thank you today for, for being light beacons to us. Um, yeah, I've got no words to, but let me move on rather. <coughs> it is evident from Genesis to Revelation that this divine journey race is designed to call Christians to run in communion. The early Christians referred to these togetherness as koinonia. Koinonia be meaning being together. So the church refers to themselves as koinonia. It's a group of people living and existing together in fellowship. In reading the, act, the book of Acts in the New Testament, it is evident that these Christians do not only share the common vision, but also gathered frequently. These gatherings started with 11 disciples that evolved into small koinonia churches, resulting into, as of today, 2.2 billion Christians today. That is the power of koinonia which we have here. We should protect it. In preparing this message, and for the past month, I've been convicted with the instructions of the prophet Haggai. In Haggai 1.7, 1, 1, 1, 1 verse 7, I work too much with tech companies, so it's version 1.7. <laughs> this is what the Lord Almighty says to the God and church. Give careful thought to your ways. 
go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. Based on this and what I've witnessed over the past 10 months, I would say that God is preparing the Garden Church International for growth. But for this to happen, we need to do two things. One, we need to consider our ways. We need to take stock. Meaning, we need to consider our motives and our actions. Faith, action, from a spiritual perspective, and action from a physical perspective. Go fetch the wood. And start preparing the timber for building his church. How opportune it is that we're busy with the building project. We cannot see it. It's not evident, but we have faith that we are going to move towards it. And we're going to sit, come together maybe in six months, 12 months, or maybe a little bit longer and look back and say, Did, could we imagine what God had in plan for us and has prepared for us in advance? In Haggai, the prophecy also come to the encouragement and promise, be strong and work, I am with you. But now declares the Lord, be strong all you people in the land, declares the Lord, for so I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what I covenanted with you and when you came out of Egypt and my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake up nations, which is happening. And what is designed by all nations will come, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord. And in this place, I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. We are being prepared to pre prepare, compete, and endure. It is a long race. We have to prepare for this race. The race has been marked out for us. There are supporters around us. And our eyes should be fixed. We should envision Jesus Christ, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. I can testify as family, without the daily bread of Jesus, I would not be able to stand here today. I came to learn that I need daily bread from him. If I do not envision, the pain and the suffering become severe, almost unbearably. I would like you to leave you with the last thoughts of a scripture I came across in chapter 37 of the book of Job. Bear with me a little longer, and I will show you that there is more one who has perfect knowledge is with you. He does not take his eye off the righteous. Can I pray for us? Father, we, we thank you that we may stand before you today. I pray that the seed of this world, of, of this word, with, will find soil to grow in and that your, your seed will germinate and that oaks will grow in this congregation, this meeting today. I pray for changed hearts. I pray, Father, that we will take stock of our lives and that we will have faith in you in everything we do. Support us in this. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, AJ, for uh, your prachtige getuigenis. Echt uh, geweldig om uh, te horen hoe God mensen leidt. We lopen een klein beetje uit, maar... Ach, ik ben vaak in diensten geweest die vier uur duurden. Dus ik heb eigenlijk alle tijd. En wie, uh, 
het niet uithoudt, die gaat maar. <laughs> maar dit is een belangrijk onderdeel, het avondmaal. En meestal denk ik dan even van tevoren na van waar moet je het nou over hebben bij het avondmaal. Je kan het heel sec vieren, gewoon alleen het avondmaal. Maar en dan vraag ik altijd aan de heer van, hebt u niet een woord of een gedachte? En toen kwam het woord juk bij me naar boven. En um, daar ben ik over na gaan denken. En je hebt een viertal soorten jukken. Je hebt een letterlijk juk, dat is eigenlijk zo'n houten balk op je schouder met van die touwen eraan. Daar zitten emmers aan en daar kun je dingen mee verplaatsen. Je hebt het ook bij dieren die onder één juk zijn. Soms kan dat heel zinnig zijn als je dat geestelijk vertaalt. Dat je soms met een oude rot in het vak meeloopt, op welk gebied dan ook. Geestelijk of in je werk. Daar kun je heel veel van leren. Je hebt natuurlijk ook een figuurlijk juk. Een juk van slavernij. Um. En bijbels gezien wordt er op heel veel plaatsen, als je erin duikt, over een juk gesproken. Um. Leviticus 26, vers 13, er staat... Ik ben de Heere uw God, die u uit het land van de Egyptenaren geleid heeft. Zoals E.J. uit Afrika geleid is... En dat gebeurde met Pesach, met Pasen, zodat u niet meer slaven bent. Ik heb de stangen van uw juk gebroken en u rechtop laten gaan. Je ziet vaak dat mensen of geestelijk of letterlijk gebogen gaan lopen door de zwaarte van een juk. Ik zie dat vaak toch wel om me heen en ik ken het van mijn eigen leven. Dat je onder een last gebukt kunt gaan... En dat druk je neer. En de Bijbel noemt daar wel een aantal dingen in. Waar je je juk erg zwaar mee kan maken. Er staat in Klaagliederen 1 vers 14. Het juk van mijn overtredingen. Als je leeft met veel overtredingen. Dan drukt dat je ter neer. Je kan ook een moeilijke jeugd hebben gehad. Of een nare ervaring in een kerk. Ook allemaal mensenwerk, kerken zijn mensenwerk. En God werkt daar doorheen en dat is geweldig. Maar dat kan je neerdrukken. Je ziet ook vaak dat er op heel veel plaatsen, op je werk, maar ook in gemeenten, dat er geroddeld wordt, dat er kwaadsprekerij is. En soms komt dat van buitenaf en uh, soms doe je daar zelf aan mee. Dat druk je neer. Je hebt jezelf ermee. Er zijn heel veel andere dingen. Er zijn heel veel mensen die lijden aan verwerping. Dat je negatief denkt over jezelf. En um, dat geeft schuldgevoel. Maar vaak zie je dat ook. Dat je jezelf ter neer drukt. Als je niet positief over jezelf denkt. Maar je moet ook zachtmoedig leren te worden naar jezelf toe. Dat je jezelf niet met een schuldgevoel opzadelt, want dat is een juk, dat drukt je neer. Wat je ook wel ziet, is dat er mensen, dat noemen ze heel mooi, religieus wetticisme. Dat is, je hangt een bepaalde theologie aan en daar ben je mee opgegroeid... En je wil dan eigenlijk niks anders horen. Je blijft daar je in vastbijten. En je kunt het haast niet loslaten, maar het kan een juk zijn voor je. Nou, één ding weet ik. Um, je moet eerst leren om te zien of er een juk in je leven is. En dat is bij ons, bijna ons allemaal, wel aanwezig of geweest. Je moet het gaan zien, dan moet je het erkennen... En één ding weet ik, je moet er van af zien te komen. En in het avondmaal komt Jezus naar ons toe en vraagt aan een ieder van ons, wil jij het juk waar je onder gebukt gaat, wil je dat inleveren? We zijn op weg naar, zoals Abraham ook zei, naar een geweldige stad, naar een bruiloft. 
Maar als je een juk op je schouders hebt en het is zwaar, het leven loopt moeilijk. Dan vraag je je soms af, heer ga ik die eindstreep wel halen? Maar vandaag kun je een nieuw begin maken. Onze hemelse vader, daar ben ik van overtuigd, die wil dat we blij door het leven gaan. En avondmaal vieren, ik heb het vaak gezegd als ik het uh, mocht doen, dat is niet zwaar. Je moet het ook niet als zwaar of heel plechtig of heel moeilijk zien. Je moet wel onderscheid hebben. Als je leeft in zonde, laat het aan je voorbij gaan. Dan is het niet voor jou op dat moment. Dan moet je dat eerst in orde maken. Maar aan de andere kant, Jezus viert het niet totdat we bij hem zijn. Dus wij zijn zo bevoorrecht dat we avondmaal mogen vieren. Waarin Jezus naar ons toe komt. Hij komt bij ons en staat voor je. Hij is hier, want twee of drie in zijn naam zijn, daar is hij. Dus hij komt naar een ieder van ons toe, deze morgen, met het avondmaal. Hij zegt, hier ben ik. Mijn lichaam is gebroken, mijn bloed is vergoten, zodat jij vrij bent, ook van een juk. Dan heb je nog een laatste juk, dat heb ik het Jezusjuk genoemd, want hij biedt je een nieuw juk aan. Dat oude juk gaat eraf krijg je een nieuw juk. Dan denk je, nou, daar ben ik mooi klaar mee. Dat schiet natuurlijk niet op als je het ene juk kwijt bent en je moet weer aan het volgende. Maar het is een heel ander soort juk. En dat moet je leren. Het is een leerschool. Wij mogen worden zoals Jezus. En dat wil hij graag dat wij dat juk op ons nemen. Jezus zegt, kom naar mij toe. En hij komt vanmorgen naar ons toe. Allen die vermoeid en belast zijn... En ik zal u rust geven. Neem mijn juk op u en leer van mij dat ik zachtmoedig ben en nederig van hart. En u zult rust vinden voor uw ziel. Want mijn juk is zacht en mijn last is licht. Ik heb het een klein beetje ingekort, maar je kan er nog veel meer over zeggen. Maar onthoud één ding. Als je van dingen last hebt, is het niet altijd makkelijker om eraf te komen. Soms heb je hulp nodig... Kom dan ook. Soms heb je pastorale hulp nodig. Soms heb je medische hulp nodig. Kan van alles nodig zijn. En dat is allemaal fantastisch dat het er is. Maar kom en meld het. Dan kunnen we samen hulp zoeken als je vast zit. Voor het avondmaal, ik wil vast vragen of de mensen het willen gaan uitdelen die door David gevraagd zijn. Dan... uh... Loopt dat vast. Ik wil voor de avondmaal viering een stukje uit uh, Lucas lezen. Lucas 22, vers 14 tot 20. En toen het uur gekomen was, ging hij aan tafel aanleggen. Dat zullen we hier maar niet doen, denk ik, want dan wordt het zo'n bende als we hier allemaal gaan liggen. Hij ging aan tafel aanliggen en de twaalf apostelen met hem. En hij zei tegen hen, ik heb er vurig naar verlangd dit paasga met u te eten, voordat ik ga lijden. Want ik zeg u dat ik daar zeker niet meer van zal eten, totdat het vervuld is in het koninkrijk van God. En nadat hij een drinkbeker genomen had en gedankt had, zei hij, neem deze... En deel hem onder elkaar. Want ik zeg u dat ik niet drinken zal van de vrucht van de wijnstok. Totdat het koninkrijk van God gekomen is. En hij nam een brood. En nadat hij gedankt had, brak hij het. En gaf het aan hen met de woorden. Dit is mijn lichaam dat voor u gegeven wordt. Doe dat tot mijn gedachtenis. Evenzo nam hij ook de drinkbeker na het gebruiken van de maaltijd en zei, deze drinkbeker is het nieuwe verbond in mijn bloed dat voor u vergoten wordt. Vader, we danken u dat we mogen weten dat u hier bij ons bent en dat Jezus voor ons staat en dat hij ons het avondmaal aanbiedt. En het is zo'n feest en zo'n vreugde om te mogen weten dat we verlost zijn en gereinigd zijn... Dat de dood geen macht meer over ons heeft. Dat we vrij mogen zijn, ook van elk juk, want u hebt het aan het kruis verbroken. We bidden u dat u zo een ieder tot zijn hart spreekt. 
over dit avondmaal. En ik zegen het brood, het lichaam van Jezus stelt het voor dat gebroken is voor ons. En dat is zo fantastisch. Als dat niet gebeurd was, waar zouden we zijn geweest? En ik zegen het brood in de naam van Jezus. En ook de, de wijn, het, het bloed van Jezus, het symbool van het bloed van Jezus dat voor ons vergoten is. Um, er zit altijd zoveel in het avondmaal, vind ik. Er zijn mensen die ziek zijn. Ik vind het avondmaal altijd zo'n uitgelezen moment dat je met je ziekte ook naar Jezus mag gaan. Als je last hebt van je, er zijn een paar mensen die hebben een knie gehad, eh, breng het bij Jezus. Dus als je, wat je ook hebt, hij, wees vrijmoedig. We moeten ons die schulden voelen niet te neergedrukt, maar we mogen vrij zijn en zeggen, Jezus, u staat voor me, dit heb ik nodig. Mag je gewoon vragen. Daarom is het avondmaal zo fantastisch. Ik zegen ook het bloed van Jezus. In de naam van Jezus. En uh, ik denk dat iedereen uh, voorzien is. We zijn goed getimed. We hebben ze goed gedaan, jongens. Maar we mogen het, uh, het brood eten. En denk aan Jezus hè? en niet aan mij of zo. Dat is niet interessant. Jezus. Ik mag ook het, uh, het bloed drinken. Ik had nog een mooi stukje gelezen van Anne Graham Lotz, maar dat is een dochter van Billy Graham, dat laat ik even... Rusten. Maar ik heb wel een bemoediging voor iedereen die er is. En dat is Psalm 28, vers 7. Een hele korte tekst. De Heere is mijn kracht en mijn schild. Op hem heeft mijn hart vertrouwd en ik ben geholpen. Nou, neem dat mee voor deze week. En God zegen jullie allemaal.